All right. Hey, everyone. So, uh, I don't know about you. I'm kind of excited to change things up a little bit. Uh, what was it, the past three streams? We've been talking about Defender Application Control. Uh, we made a ton of progress, in my opinion, um, from starting with practically zero knowledge to working our way up to, well, starting by building a, a driver uh, allow rule, um, or driver allow rules followed by uh, user mode rules, incorporating all that together and actually getting like a workable VM. And then we started diving into like auditing those events and um, uh, we made a lot of progress. Um, hopefully people learned a lot in those, in those past three streams and we'll plan on continuing that thread and diving a little bit deeper as we go along in future streams. So for example, I believe next week I'll probably focus on PowerShell constrained language mode. Um, so that is like the, when you've enabled um, app locker and defender, and defender application control, when you've got those in enforcement mode, Constraint language mode is like the enforcement mechanism for PowerShell specifically. Um, because if you didn't have something that would lock PowerShell down and you didn't explicitly block PowerShell, which is honestly kind of a hard thing to do, um, then PowerShell being as powerful as it is, um, I liken it to like a debugger. There's like, there's nothing you can't do to, um, like in user mode code um, that you wouldn't be able to do, to do in any other language in pure PowerShell. So we'll, um, and constrained language mode is the lockdown mode that locks down a lot of the super powerful things that you can do in PowerShell to otherwise break out and get arbitrary unsigned code execution. But anyway, uh, we're not here to talk about that today. Hey, Lord Conover, thanks for joining. Appreciate it. Um, so instead, we're going to be talking about AMC. So this is Microsoft's anti-malware scan interface. Um, if you're joining already, I assume you're at least somewhat familiar with what AMC is. Uh, if not, I'll give I'll just give a tiny bit of background. So AMC is um, it's a lot of components. Um, so there's really two components. There's like a, a client component. Let's say like PowerShell or BB script. Hey, beef soup. What's up? Um, so let's say we're PowerShell and we want our AV engine that happens to opt in to AMC to scan our like in memory buffer and give us a thumbs up, thumbs down. Is this thing evil or not? So that kind of in a nutshell is how it works. Now, again, like I said, as an AV vendor, you have to explicitly opt in to AMC in the form of developing your own AMC provider, right? So um, when you're the client application that says, hey, I've got this buffer that I need you, AV provider, to check for me, what you do in code is there are several functions. Um, they're all well-documented in MSDN. Um, there's some like initialization functions that you call, but ultimately when you're ready to pass your buffer to be scanned by AV, you'll call AMC scan buffer uh, or AMC scan string. And then uh, AV engine will return the result of the scan in the form of uh, this AMC result enum, okay? And if it's bad, uh, I don't have internet on my VM. Uh, in the case of it being bad, um, there's a particular value returned. We'll come back to what that value is. Um, I guarantee we'll come back to that. But anyway, that will indicate if it's uh, if it didn't detect anything versus if it did. And then it's ultimately up to the program that opts in to AMC, in this case, like we we're talking about PowerShell, as to how that is handled. So in the case of PowerShell, what makes sense to do, like I think we could all agree, would be to surface an error to the user saying, hey, AV determined that this thing is evil and to not execute it. 
uh, and then AV, however AV wants to handle that event from there, uh, it can handle it. Um, so that's how PowerShell chooses to handle things. Um, and there are many, well, there's a handful of other components that like client components built into Windows that opt into AMC. So what do I mean by that? Like uh, code that says, hey, I have a buffer AV that I would love for you to scan. So what are those components? Uh, Microsoft doesn't document all of them that well. Um, so at one point I decided I would try to tackle that and I did in this blog post. Um, so what I covered was like the methodology that I used to ask of like all PEs on the file system, hey, PE, do you opt into AMC? And if so, um, I, I cover that and then I uh, display the results here. All right, so of the components that opt into AMC is consent.exe. So this is related to UAC elevation, which to be honest, I have not really dived into uh, UAC AMC introspection. There's actually um, UAC specific functions that are not documented, um, but we're, we're not gonna get into that. Um, so JScript and BBScript, in other words, uh, Windows script host uh, scripting languages uh, are gonna opt in to that. So when I was scanning through this at the time, what was new to me was fastprox.dll. So it turns out that you can get some AV introspection and insight uh, of uh, WMI tradecraft potentially. So that's pretty interesting. Um, .NET, or sorry, PowerShell, system.management.automation.dll. Um, if you weren't already familiar, um, I always like to say like PowerShell is not PowerShell.exe, rather PowerShell is system.management.automation.dll. That's the core .NET component that actually implements all of PowerShell's functionality. Um, a recent, relatively recent addition was CLR.dll. As of .NET 4.8 and above, I believe, anytime uh, the uh, system.reflection.assembly uh, load methods are called, or any of the module, like in-memory module load methods are called, AMC has an opportunity to inspect the entire PE um, in memory, which is really cool. Uh, and last but not least, VBE7. So I, I'm actually not entirely clear as to when uh, this was introduced in Office uh, VBA macros. I know there's, there's a good article um, that Microsoft supplied on this, but um, we're, we're gonna dive into to just a few of these. Um, and really the, the goal of this stream is really just to identify like what optics are actually available. So what I would like for us to determine is can we capture all of these AMC buffers without having to do any like crazy hooking into AV components? Like, could we just like tap into those optics and maybe like do a trace to capture all that raw data? And then uh, if that's possible, see if we could derive any useful meaning from that trace data. So what I had in mind was maybe take like some potential malware samples, uh, run them, uh, like start an AMC trace and see if we can derive any interesting information from there, like without introducing any analysis tools in our analysis, uh, analysis environment. So that'd be pretty cool if we could achieve that. Um, in order to do that, we're gonna need some, some background information. So having dug into AMC quite a bit, um, you know, I've, I've grown to, to know the, the code base uh, over time here. And um, so I guess, where, where, where do we start? Um, if you read up on the, on the documentation for AMC, 
for example, if you're reading up on AMC scan buffer, um, as is the case in M any uh, MSDN documentation, you scroll down to the bottom and it will tell you the implementing DLL that the function uh, is exported from, right? So uh, as a reverse engineer, this would be a logical place to start your investigation of into seeing like how this is actually implemented under the hood. So why don't we go ahead and do that? So I'm just going to throw that into Ida here. And don't worry too much. Like if you're not super comfortable with with assembly or IDA, we're not gonna really be digging too deep into this here. Really, I just wanna point you to a couple of relevant uh, tracing functions. They're gonna be related to ETW. All right, uh, what I always like to do is load symbols when I'm working with uh, Microsoft code. And I have pre-downloaded those symbols. So I'm gonna load those up. And you'll notice that all of the um, unmarked functions here on the left are now nicely annotated because we've applied symbols. Now, um, let's just start by digging into the AMC scan buffer function. Okay. Again, we're not we're not really doing anything crazy here. Like I just want to point you to some relevant functions. All right. Um, so this, actually, well, th this is kind of relevant. Um, a while back, uh, at my former employer, uh, we released all of our um, our old PowerShell course, and we have a module dedicated to AMPSI, um, configuring, oh, not really configuring it, but like analyzing it and bypassing it. And uh, one of the bypasses that was discussed was because you can control memory um, in, in PowerShell really easily, um, we were able to tamper with um, initialized uh, AMC uh, sessions. And one of the things we did was like, we got a handle to an AMC session. And like, there's this one check when, um, so I just converted the hex to, uh, to, to ASCII here. There's a check when we're in, again, we're in the um, AMC scan buffer function. So the handle to the session is dereferenced and the first four bytes to this opaque data structure is referenced. And the first one, uh, one of the first checks it does is are the first four characters AMSI? Uh, if not, then something is corrupted, right? So go ahead and error out. Uh, I think we can resolve this to something here. Yeah. Invalid argument. All right. Otherwise, like if all these sanity checks um, pass, then we go do the interesting like AMC related stuff. Right. Now there's this um, indirect call that happens here. Um, so we're not really going to trace through that. Um, but once you poke around through here enough, what you'll find is that there are several calls to ETW uh, tracing related functions. So I'm just gonna do a control F here and search for event. And the relevant event that is interesting is event write. So what is, it, what is the event write function? All right, use this function to write an event. Thanks Microsoft, great documentation there. Um, if you've grown familiar with this function, which I'm sure not many of you have, um, what this is, is if you want to write any event to the event log um, or to an ETW event, now the event log for all intents and purposes is backed by ETW, right? And ETW, if you're not familiar, is uh, it stands for Event Tracing for Windows. So it's this eventing subsystem built into the operating system where you can have code, in this case, uh, whatever's calling event write, 
in this case, it's going to be amc.dll, says, hey, I would like to write an event. And so one function that you would call to write event data is this function here. So where does that go? So when you write this, you have to specify a few things. So you have to get a handle. So where do you get this handle? You get that from event register. Oops, I'm not connected. Well, with event, oh no, I lost it. Boo. Well, um, all right, well, I'll just reconnect temporarily here. Okay. And disconnect. All right, cool. So you have to get a handle by calling event register. Um, and what you're specifying in event register is the ETW provider that you want to write event data to. All right. We're going to dig into event providers and what they are in, in just a little bit. Once you get that handle, then you say, hey, what event for this given provider would you like to write to? So this is essentially like the event ID and some other um, additional things. Um, but the, the main thing that you should be concerned about is the, uh, the, the, the event ID that the code is writing to. The next is event data descriptors. So this is the actual event data. Now you can't just arbitrarily write whatever data you want. Um, ETW providers and their respective event IDs expect a certain amount of event fields. And for each event field, there's a, an expected uh, data type. So how can you possibly know what data and data types and fields to write to? We'll, we'll dive into that in a little bit, all right? So not the best documentation here, but now you know, like as a reference, uh, this is called pretty frequently, all right? So let's go back into Ida and I'm gonna do control X to see what code calls this. So we have one relevant function here. So from the AMC anti malware class, there's a generate ETW event method. So we can jump into that. And um, so this is one way that AMC is able to uh, like pass off telemetry, right? So AMC in its implementation has to pass the buffers off to the respective um, AMC provider. So the, the AV provider gets the content via its own means, but AMC scan buffer happens to also write a copy of that buffer via ETW. So you don't even necessarily have to be an AV vendor to potentially capture this data. All right. So how would we go about capturing this? Um, well, since we're already in Ida, um, why don't we annotate a few things here? So let's annotate this a little bit. And I'm going to do this in a fairly crude fashion here. Uh, by just copying these names over. Oops. Sorry, bear with me, my key binding. I'm still not used to my key bindings here. All right. All right, so reg handle is the first argument. Oh yeah, here's, here's something you gotta be aware of. Uh, so reg handle, this data type is, uh, is a keyword, so a 64-bit value. And um, uh, let's see, how do we want to handle that? Oh. I'll probably just do this. Um, we'll call this plus four. I know that's dirty, but we'll go with that. So like that's the discrepancy that you're seeing here. There are five parameters, but only four documented ones. And that's because reg handle is actually 64 
is a 64-bit value. That caught me before and like totally, totally threw me off. Okay, what, what else do we got? All right, user data count and user data. All right, so that should automatically annotate these for me. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, so event descriptor. What is event descriptor? What is the data type? So that is a pointer to an event descriptor. Um, and so this tells me that symbols like annotated this for me, which is kind of handy, but like, you see what it's referencing? Like that's not actually parsed out properly as an event descriptor structure. So I'm going to load up that structure. Um, so I'll add a struct type. All right, event descriptor. Yeah, so like here's ID, event ID right there. Like that's the main thing we're going to be concerned with there. So now I can double click on here and I'll do um, Alt Q. Ah, wrong, wrong finding there. Okay. Um, yeah, Alt Q and apply the event descriptor data type to that. Yes, I'm sure. And then we'll um, uh, view on hide. And um, so hex 44D is 1101. All right. So apparently, when AMC calls event write, it writes to presumably an AMC related ETW provider to event ID 1101. All right using this channel. Now a channel, uh, if a channel is specified, that means that the event was uh, intended to be consumed by the event log, is my understanding. So you can have um, ETW events that are not designed to be consumed traditionally by the event log. And actually the majority of the like superset of all ETW possible ETW events are actually not designed to be consumed by the event log just because they're in place for primarily debugging purposes. Um, this is the logging level. So this event, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, four corresponds to informational logging level. Um, this will be relevant when we actually start a, uh, a trace, okay? Okay, so let's go back here. So we've annotated that. And then uh, user data count. So this tells me that there are, so uh, hex A or uh, 10 decimal uh, items to be logged. And then user data. So how do we, how are we gonna annotate this? This is an event data descriptor structure. Um, I'm not gonna go through this whole process, but I'll just start it. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of like what my process is for making sense of uh, these ETW events when I'm reversing stuff. So I'm going to add the event data descriptor structure. And then, so this first pointer, I'm going to apply event data descriptor. Okay, and then let's go back into the code here. And so now that that's been applied, um, you'll see it annotated a little bit better. So user data. Now this structure, the actual data to be logged is in the user data dot uh, pointer field. So that's populated via EAX. All right. So where's EAX come from? It comes from here. Where does this local variable come from? Um, I mean, we could just scroll up and see if there are like any direct cross references to that. Sorry for this painful scrolling. I'm just quickly scanning to see. Yeah, so like here's something here. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really have a ton of context at this point. Um, 
and I'm honestly not terribly concerned right now, and I'll come back to why. So what we're going to do now is, um, well, actually, yeah, I want to find out what this reg handle is so that we can determine what um, the actual ETW provider is being logged, all right? So we've got like the event data, but we still don't know like what ETW provider this event is actually going to. Um, so let's see. And the function that it said to call was event register, I think. Yeah. So let's look at cross references to this. And it's probably going to be this function. Yeah. So um, I think it's this one. This should be a GUID. So let me um, apply that. Okay. So this should be the um, the ETIB provider uh, GUID. So ETIB providers um, can have a name assigned to them, but they'll but that's optional. Um, at a minimum, they have to have a unique GUID. So what am I talking about here? You can, you can enumerate all of the registered ETW providers using a built-in utility called logman. So we do logman query providers. It's gonna take a few seconds to do its thing. And then it is gonna dump out a metric crap ton of registered ETW providers. So on the left column is the name of the provider. And then on the right is a corresponding uh, unique uh, GUID assigned to that provider. Um, so back in the day when I was inspecting these things, what was noteworthy to me was the one called anti, or the set of providers called anti-malware. Uh, SLS is an alias for select string, by the way. It's like the grep of PowerShell. All right. So look at all these anti-malware providers. All right. So Microsoft anti-malware scan interface. This looked like a potentially interesting candidate. All right. So note the GUID 2A576B87. All right, do we have a match? It appears so, all right. So what I've confirmed is that it is indeed the case that amc.dll is writing event data to this provider via event ID 1101, all right. So we can get a little bit more information in logman about this provider if you just supply the explicit name here oops no all right let's try that again okay um so you get a little bit more information so one thing that's going to be relevant is the um the the keyword all right so the keyword value was supplied, ah, wrong function. Where was that? Okay. So it was in the event descriptor here. And the keyword specified was this. So this is a 64 bit value. So it's got that eight and the one in there. So what, what does that correspond to, right? Well, it corresponds to this event one ORed with AMC debug. All right. So keywords is like a built in kind of crude way to do um, very rudimentary filtering when you're doing ETW traces. So um, if there were many different event IDs supported for a provider, then you could logically group them together by keyword so that when you start a trace, 
you could say like, hey, just trace based on these keywords and then you'd only be capturing a subset of ETW events, all right? And then um, it appears the only uh, supported logging level for this provider is four or informational, which uh, again was confirmed here in amc.dll when the event was written, all right? Uh, another cool thing with Logman when you clear the provider is it will tell you the code that um, has a handle to this provider. Okay, by process ID, and then if it can resolve the image name, then it does that for you. So this is pretty cool because like now I know that PowerShell.exe is doing something with logging to the anti malware scan interface. Same with VM Tools uh, D.exe, which is kind of interesting to me. Um, I'm not sure what component of VMware Tools will be doing that. Like, I don't happen to know if that's like a, a .NET thing or something. Same with SVC Host. Um, I don't know. Like, but what's cool? is that we could dig in further. We have the process ID and, um, you know, we could uh, dive in and like figure out in the case of SVC host, like what is the DLL that's actually um, in the shared service host process that's doing AMC related stuff. Oh, hey, VectorSec, uh, it's Eric, right? Thanks for joining, man. Yeah, so yeah, maybe copy, uh, you're saying maybe copy paste of files to and from the VM. Yeah, that's, I mean, uh, it's a good, good guess. Your, your guess is as good as mine. Um, but yeah, like specifically, what is the like AMC related functionality that's going on in VM tools D I, I'm not sure, but I'm not too concerned about, it, but it's cool that you get to see that is, is the point. So we could dig in further if we wanted to. Okay. All right, so what we still haven't determined though is like, what are the event fields that are supported for event ID 1101? Like, so we need to make sense from that. And we're not getting the context that we really want via the logman utility. So here's where uh, we'll ideally need to rely upon some third party utilities. And there's a couple that I use. Um, so let me run the first. Um, I think I had this pre-staged somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So let me try this command here. So the first tool is Perfu. Why is it? Oh, I think it's because I'm in PowerShell. Yup. Okay. All right. So Perfu is a free and open source tool from Microsoft for like .NET or no, I think just like uh, analyzing ETW traces. So one thing that you can do in it is use it to recover uh, binary uh, ETW event manifests. So the way these things are stored is like they're registered in the registry and in the registry, it points to a DLL that contains this binary event manifest. Um, and that binary format that it's stored in is, is serialized XML. So Perfu, Perfu is one of the tools available that you can use to um, deserialize that binary serialized XML and recover the actual XML. So now I can just do a cat on the generated um, XML manifest and scroll up. And uh, so here is that event ID 1101. All right, logging level, informational, keyword, event one. So remember event one, we saw that in Logman. Um, 
And it's also identified here as the, the number one for that keyword. And then the event template, so these are the, the fields, it says the event fields are, dis, are um, defined in the following template. Okay, So there's actually only one event actually implemented in the, uh, in the AMC ETIB provider, which is certainly the exception, uh, not the norm. Usually there's, there's many of these events defined. And then, so we don't have to scroll far to see what fields are implemented for event ID 1101, all right? So, cool, we have some more context. And now, note, uh, let's see. Here, let's count these. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. I count exactly 10 decimal arguments. If we go back to Ida, note that there were exactly 10 decimal arguments passed to event right, or 10 data fields passed to it. And so the way this works is, uh, if you happen to ever be reversing this stuff, is the first, um, the first entry in this array of um, event data descriptor uh, structures is going to be the first defined field. So I can rename this to like event field, and we'll call the first one session. Okay, and then I can go into my stack view here, and just keep going down this this array of event data descriptor structures, and say, yep, I want to apply that structure type, and then I can call this event field scan status. Okay, and, and keep going, uh, so on and so forth. And then I get all of this nice annotation in my disassembly. And honestly, like I haven't reverse engineered much of anything. Like I haven't needed to get any additional context uh, within the disassembled code itself. I'm just able to cross-reference the extracted layout of fields here, which is pretty cool. So what I would do if I was to be um, reversing this to any like level of depth is I would just go into this array. I would apply the correct uh, data types in this array and then name thing, uh, name each field accordingly based on this event. And then I would have a you know nice, beautiful annotated disassembly. And then I'd really be able to make some sense of like how the data is used within uh, within the, the disassembly. Okay, um, we're gonna leave it at that in um, in Ida. Uh, really, I just wanted to show you some of the related API calls for when ETW is used for tracing, and I wanted to demonstrate like roughly what my workflow is for identifying the ETW provider that events are being written to and the corresponding event IDs. All right. So we have a little bit of background on that. We've, I, we've positively identified that, um, like, I think we can confidently say that AMC is logging to, um, to that, what was it? The, uh, the Microsoft anti-malware scan interface ETW provider. So now we have a starting point to potentially capture this, in, this potentially interesting data, all right, via an ETW trace, all right? Cool. So why don't we close out AMC for now? And let's just experiment with tracing. So the way we start a trace is using the same utility logman. And um, before you get too confused with the esoteric syntax for logman, like don't worry too much. Like it took me forever to learn the syntax because like ETW is hard. Like I mean, uh, like I understand it really well now, but like 
really understanding ETW from like a security context, like definitely took me a while. There's just so much like esoteric terminology that isn't well documented. So, I mean, at least hopefully, hopefully I'm making some sense as I, as I walk you through this. Um, so if you want to start an ETW trace, you're going to do logman start, and then you give it a trace name. I'm going to call this, um, AMC trace test and then you specify a provider that you want to capture all right so i want to do a trace of any events that are being written to the microsoft anti malware scan interface provider which we now know any code that writes events via amc.dll is going to write events to that provider all right next what do we need to supply we need to supply a keyword or a combination of keywords and logging levels all right um i saw that when event write no let's see yeah i so i think i'm just going to try to get away with using the event one keyword oops all right, so the way you do this here is I think you have to put it in parentheses. Oh, and because we're in PowerShell, PowerShell is trying to interpret those parentheses in a special way. So we're going to tell PowerShell not to interpret those. And the way we do that in PowerShell is dash dash percent. So if you were in a regular command prompt, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't have to do that. All right. So I'm specifying the keyword that I want to capture, event one, and then I need to specify the logging level. And based on the manifest, so event ID 1101 uses the informational event level. Yeah, and the, um, and the event one keyword. So I'm gonna, I do zero X four to say, hey, yep, I wanna capture informational events um, and so this is saying in effect give me all event id 1101 events unfortunately there's no way to um, to tell logman hey only give me 1101 the only filtering mechanism etw gives you out of the box is by keyword and logging level hey dead man jogging so you're saying uh yeah you're doing this with frida yesterday yeah oh that's awesome so like were you doing some like hooking of like etw logging if so yeah that's that's pretty cool stuff um okay so and then what we need to specify is where are we going to output our trace to so dash o for output um oh you're hooking mc scan buffer sweet that's really cool um yeah, so, and yeah, thanks for mentioning that. So like you're doing some cool hooking with Frida on capturing the uh, arguments being passed to MC scan buffer. But because um, through our brief analysis in Ida, we saw that it appears as though the arguments are more or less just uh, passed directly to event right. We should be able to capture these events without doing any hooking using etw so we'll call this uh amc trace test dot etl all right and then last but not least i always forget what this means but like if you want to do like a real-time trace you just have to do dash ets uh like it's not documented well uh anywhere so it's important remember dash ets when you start these traces, <laughs> I, I don't like have a good reason why, like just, just do it. <laughs> okay. So it looks like that trace started. And now what we want to do is exercise functionality that we think would cause AMC events to be written to that ETW provider. All right. So I don't know, um, like PowerShell appears to be one of those things. So what if we just did, launched a new PowerShell, maybe. Ah. 
No, not that one. Okay. So it looks like event data is being logged here. Um, so considering that, yeah, why don't we just stop the trace? So I'll do logman stop uh, MC trace test. And again, you have to supply uh, ETS to actually stop that. Okay, so, all right, looks like it grew in size a little bit. Cool. Um, so what do we do with this ETL? Um, traditionally, an ETL consists of, well, ETL stands for event trace log, I think. And I don't know the binary file format that well, but like historically speaking, it stores event data without any of the uh, type information included in the ETL. Um, that appears to have changed as of recently. I don't know what change uh, there was, but because um, like a lot of times you'd have to convert an ETL to some other format and then point it to the uh, registered ETW manifest to pull that event information to actually like make sense of what that raw data is using a, a tool called um, uh, trace RPT. All right, so that's one way you can do that. Like you just take the ETL and you can, you specify the output format, which it supports um, CSV, EVTX and XML. So that would take the ETL file and then actually make sense of it. Now this assumes that you have an event manifest for the ETLP provider, which you won't always have. Uh, in the case of AMC, you do. Like it is a formally registered ETLP provider that has a manifest. As you saw, like we, we pulled that manifest from earlier, okay? Um, so why don't we just start poking around some of these events? And the way that we can do this natively in PowerShell is with the get win events commandlet and you specify dash path. Give the ETL. And the first time you do it, you're gonna get an error. And it says that ETLs can only be read in forward chronological order. So you have to do dash oldest. I don't know why that's the case, but you just have to do it when you're working with ETLs that way. So Cool, look at this. We have some event IDs, uh, 1101 events. So let's look at the first one here. Um, let's break out this object. I'm sure there's some more properties here, yep. All right, so here's the event message, AMPSI scan buffer. Well, hmm, that's not a very uh, detailed contextual message. Like that doesn't really um, supply us with any useful information. Um, but based upon pulling the manifest earlier, presumably there should still be event fields in the event, right? So um, if you haven't run into this before, um, it's a common misconception that like the only way, if you're dealing with specifically event log data, that um, the data that you're pulling and like forwarding from the event log will only be surfaced via the event message. That's absolutely not the case. Um, in most cases, um, the event log being backed by, um, it's called manifest-based ETW, like this being one of those manifests. Uh, when, a, when an event is written, it's written as XML. And within that XML are all of these properties that are actually populated. Okay, so um, in PowerShell, we can view those properties via the properties property. <laughs> cool. Now, how do we make further sense of this? Um, before we dive into this, I wanted to show you one other utility that I really like when I am investigating interesting new uh, ETW providers. 
So this is a tool called Web Explorer. Um, it's, it's open source, it's on GitHub. There's several other tools out there. Like I've just been using this one for a while, so I like it. Uh, it's pretty bare bones. It's not, doesn't really do anything fancy. Um, so I'm, so you can search by ETW provider GUID or name. So I'll just start with anti malware. Um, and yeah, there's a scan interface. So you double click it. And then over here, like it tells you, like we already knew this, like it supports the event one keyword. And then down here at the bottom, it will tell you all of the supported events. And based on the manifest that we pulled earlier with uh, Perfview, um, this confirms that, yeah, there's, there's only one supported event. But what I like about Web Explorer is that it will give you the event message as well. Um, the Perfview output does not supply you with the actual event message. What it is good at is it supplies you with the event fields and their corresponding data types. Now, Web Explorer, to my knowledge, only gives you the event field names. It does not give you the corresponding data types. Okay, so pros and cons with with each solution. Um, but ultimately, like both Perfu and Web Explorer are just kind of like informational utilities to um, kind of point you in the right direction, right? Now, what we need to do now is make a little bit more sense of like the PowerShell properties property, right? Um, but like using the context that we have, let's go back to the manifest here. So like, let's see, so hash content, like does it look like this might correspond here? to those fields, like, I think it's a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So actually the, the easiest tell would be like, is the last field a Boolean? Because there are no other Booleans. And yeah, this is indeed a Boolean, right? So yeah, one-to-one -one correspondence of fields. So uh, unfortunately, this is the thing I, I don't particularly like about get win event, is that even if the field data can like the field names can be parsed. They're not presented to you, only the field data. Um, so we could write some automation to like create like PowerShell custom objects to do that. And uh, sure enough, I, I did do that. So let me, let me open that up and, and share this with you. By the way, um, I will go back and take uh, some rough notes of everything that we've covered and what I'll try to do, please don't hold me too strictly to it, is post um, like stream notes at the end of each stream in the form of like probably a markdown document on, on GitHub. So you can expect that for, for this one at least. Okay, so I wrote this little function ahead of time. Um, it just, it calls, it calls get win event, what we just did. And um, specifically, it just filters out 1101 events. And then for each 1101 event returned, it goes through and makes sense of each one, right? So the uh, third property corresponds to uh, what? Is that right? Three. So scan status, scan result, app name. What am I missing here? Because this looks like the app name. I feel like I'm missing something here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What am I not seeing here that I'm missing? Because like, I'm pretty sure this one is the result, like the, the AMC result. So like thumbs up, thumbs down detection. Um, yeah, I forget why, why it's like that.
but that's just the way that that's the way it came out but yeah so like what i've done is like i went through all the properties here and um create a custom object for it so um like one thing that's like kind of annoying is what is it this one so this is the hash as a byte array, right? And here's the the AMPC content as a byte array, right? Not very useful. Yeah. Yeah, is that Brian? Yeah, so like, so this this is the um, like third index, right? So like zero, one, two. The third one but then based on like the manifest that i pulled scan result should be the second one um but because like powershell arrays are indexed by zero like index two would correspond to the third entry in this event which like doesn't line up so um i don't know <laughs> i forget like why that's the case but anyway so here what um let's do this so i'm gonna <clears throat> dot source that so now I can kind of abstract this stuff away and make a little more sense of these events all right cool let me um, save this to a variable How's that look? So content, I took the um, the raw byte array and just converted it to a Unicode string. And sure enough, you get like the raw content. So um, in the case of PowerShell, anytime any script block is ever executed, uh, AMC gets a chance to see it. Of course, caveat, I'm sure there are some offensive people in here or, those who are aware of AMC bypasses, um, there, there, there's a whole world of AMC bypasses out there. Um, I've contributed a handful of them myself. Um, we're not going to cover bypasses. Like that's an entirely dedicated subject um, as to covering the attack surface and methodology for bypassing those. But just know, yes, there are many, there are many bypasses. It's not my point to uh, to cover those. And there's crap ton of blog posts on that anyway um so like this this is what av is seeing okay and what i think is really cool is that we didn't have to do any hooking we didn't have to implement our own uh amc av provider interface to capture this like we just did a little bit of legwork to confirm that amc is actually writing these um, the same event data that the AMC provider gets to the AMC ETW provider. And then we just trace that. And so we get all that rich context um, without needing to introduce any tooling or have to write any code, all right? So um, where was our trace code here? So like it took, it took a little bit of legwork to figure out that we actually wanted to trace events from the Microsoft Anti-Malware Scan Interface provider, specifying this keyword and this logging level, right? And then we need a, a little bit of context as to how to, um, where was it? If we go back to, uh, this we needed some more context as to how to parse these out properly which we got by recovering the etw manifest for the amc provider right um so yeah once we did that legwork now we can actually make sense of what's being traced so 
you know, one potential use case for this would be uh, for dynamic malware analysis, right? Um, PowerShell, considering it sends uh, all PowerShell content um, prior to a script lock being executed, like if we could do this trace, like let's say you had a heavily obfuscated PowerShell sample that was that did that had like varying layers of deobfuscation, you could start an AMC trace for that. Now, those of you familiar with PowerShell logging would probably find that to be a little redundant um, because of script lock logging. And I would agree with you that that logging is redundant. So um, PowerShell v5, you already get script lock logging. So if you explicitly enable that, you're going to get the same level of logging that um, you get with um, by capturing this with AMC. But um, is there the equivalent of script lock logging for VBScript, for JScript, for WMI? The answer is no. All right. So here we have an opportunity to uh, leverage these ETW, um, this ETW tracing functionality to hopefully capture some some interesting stuff. So um, why don't we dive into a different um, like scripting engine? And the idea I had was just as a, like a silly example, I wrote um, this little test um, JScript payload, um, just to kind of exercise some of the quote unquote, like functionality that you might see in JScript malware. Like we're gonna launch, launch a process and then, you know, presumably have like obfuscated code that gets deobfuscated and then passed to uh, to eval. All right. So why don't we run that through C script and see what we can capture. But we got to start another trace to do that. All right. So let's go back to logman. And I'll just call this MC test trace, MC trace test two. Uh, that should be it. Okay. All right, so the trace is started. So presumably, if I just launch C script test.js, that should hopefully launch calc. Yep, cool. All right. Now, again, like there is no equivalent of PowerShell script lock logging for JScript and VBScript. So um, if I could capture some runtime context, then that would that'd be pretty cool. All right. Sweet. That looks like it captured some data. Um, oh, yeah, and I have my handy function now. Just give it the ETL file. Sweet. All right. Cool. So check it out. First of all, the first one we got was PowerShell was first logged. All right. PowerShell was logged, launching C script test.js. Sweet. Now, if I had launched that through uh, the command prompt, the command prompt does not opt in to uh, AMC, unfortunately. That would be really cool if it did, because then you could get um, like shell command context. Um, but alas, it does not. Um, and then, all right, so notice the different app name. So we get some like contextual PowerShell app name here. So like we get, yeah, it's PowerShell, the path that executed for PowerShell. So that's kind of cool. Like there's different PowerShell hosts, right? Like PowerShell.exe is not the only PowerShell host. So like, that's cool. You get that context. And then uh, I guess the version number of the assembly, I, I don't know. Um, you don't get quite that rich context in the case of JScript. This, ent this is entirely up to the code that is calling uh, like AMC scan string or AMC scan buffer, 
the app name that they want to supply. This is just what PowerShell or system.management.automation.dll chose to do, like the naming scheme for app name. Um, jscript.dll chose just straight up jscript. Um, so question, is there a way uh, or a hack to opt in other scripting DLLs like jscript9 to AMC? Um, that's a good question. Well, I mean, I guess like short answer, like, e like, is there an easy way to do that? I would say no. <laughs> um, I've not actually personally dived into the implementation of jscript9.dll. Um, but yeah, because like I'm vaguely aware of some of the bypasses, like AMC bypasses related to like launching jscript9 versus jscript.dll. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really have a good answer for you. Like, like I would say no, like there's no easy way to do that. And like, that should be on Microsoft to supply that implementation. So yeah. So yeah, Eric, like, yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't this be awesome? Like if you could just like flip a bit in the registry to turn on this level of logging, that would be fantastic. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, like really this was just, this was intended for just um, AV vendors to consume this data. Um, content name is really cool. So it gives me the, the backing file that the JScript content came from. And then I get the, the content, all right? Now we, we get two events, all right? So in the first event, we got the inner portion that was executed, all right? So the inner portion being this, okay? And then I guess the equivalent of like how it decided to log the, no, sorry. The, this is the, the outer portion. Like this is what was evaled. And this is how JScript decided to log that, All right? Um, the inner portion and how JScript decided to log that um, was this. So it's, it's not going to be like one to one logging in the case of Windows script host. And unfortunately, uh, not everything is logged through AMC. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it available, but I will link to the tweet. Um, I, I had a thread a while back where like I was reversing JScript and vbscript.dll and there is a check in the, the scanning code that says, um, like it considers the, the VB script or JScript method that's being executed. And then it like, it hashes it. Like it hashes the name of the method. And so it's got like these arrays of uh, like whitelisted hashes that if it, if there's a match, then it actually uh, logs it through AMC. Presumably they did that for maybe performance reasons that they didn't want to just outright log everything through AMC. Um, I don't know. I, and I don't really want to speculate any further, but just know that like there are potential bypass opportunities because not everything is logged, but they did do a pretty good job of identifying the, um, the VB script and JScript methods that were the most likely to be abused. And again, I will link to that tweet in the like stream notes later on, um, because further down in the stream, like Microsoft um, has a slide that like has the exact corresponding method names that are actually logged. Cool. Um, so yeah, um, pretty cool stuff. Um, obviously this is like kind of a silly little contrived example. Um, but this should give you some insight of like what is available. Um, why don't we go into, why don't we look at an actual malware sample? So this next one that we'll look at is, um, I'll supply this link in the stream notes as well. Uh, Microsoft security intelligence recently linked to a COVID themed, um, uh, macro like phishing lore. And I, managed to download that. Uh, I'm not connected to, to the internet. Cool. Um, so yeah, why don't we just run that? Oh, and start our trace and see if we can capture anything. 
Um, okay, so did I stop that? Okay, yeah, I did. So let's start a new trace. We'll call this one uh, trace test three. Okay, that's running. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, VBA tracing is special. You need to actually explicitly enable enable it. Um, and let me show you the the registry value that needs to be in place. All right. So HKCU, this whole thing here, and the value name is macro runtime scan scope. Um, I'll supply a link with a reference to this as well. Um, this is a D word value when it's set to two that indicates that all documents should be um, inspected versus I think one corresponds to um, just like untrusted documents, like whatever that means. I, I'm not really an office maldoc expert personally, um, but then if it was set to zero or not defined, then AMC scanning for VBA macros is disabled. So I know one of the the bypasses out there just sets that registry value. And like this being HKCU, like if you have code execution already, then you can just disable that. Um, you do potentially have a, a race condition or like a chicken and the egg problem. Um, I haven't investigated enough to know like I'm pretty sure like the attacker would win the race, but anyway, um, yeah, the, there's a bypass in a macro document that just sets this value to zero, I believe. Um, yeah, question, uh, docs that have mark of the web. Uh, I, I don't, I don't really know. I, I can't, I can't speak to that. And hey, Brian, thanks for joining, man. Um, okay. So I've confirmed that that is set. So, AMC scanning should be configured for VBA. So, all right. And my ETW trace is running. Cool. All right. Um, let's just let her rip, I guess. What could go wrong? Okay. Man, this, this is a pretty good lore. <laughs> F those people though. Okay. So <laughs> presumably code execution has occurred. What has happened? I don't know. Uh, the only thing I have to go on is potentially my AMC trace. Like um, certainly there are other like analysis utilities you could use, but uh, we're just focusing on ETW. Um, like AMC ETW tracing to see what we could possibly catch. So anyway, uh, let me close this out. Ryan says, by default, only docs that have mark of the web and open in protective in uh, protective mode get AMC run. Oh, okay. Um, I think, I think that has mark of the web. Uh, I can go to properties. No. No, I don't think it has Mark of the Web on it. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just know that like when I set that to two, it does appear to log stuff, <laughs> which we'll, uh, we'll confirm here in a second. Logman stop MC trace test. Yeah, yeah, I did set it properly. Um, all right, let's see. Cool, so. Whoa, that looks like it logged a lot. <laughs> All right. How many events did we get? Damn, 77. <laughs> what craziness is, is going on here? Let's let's just look at the, the first event. Okay, whoa, interesting. All right, so some things worth noting. So the app name is relevant here. 
All right. So I guess I didn't like explicitly state that um, when you're taking these traces, like this is how you distinguish like what the content actually is. So this is how you would like encode if you're automating this, know that what follows is VBA macro content, All right? Um, content name, so the, the backing uh, file that had the VBA macro. So kind of kind of cool context there. Um, and then the content. Now, um, I only just recently started in investigating uh, VBA, like AMC tracing content. And um, to be honest, I haven't made a whole lot of sense of it yet. But what I know based on um, my understanding of like having reversed some of the VB script and J script, like AMC introspection stuff is that what you're seeing here is the numeric uh, version of a like VBA method being called. So currently like I don't, I don't have a good way to um, like reverse this process to say like, you know, what, what, do, what does this, what, what VBA method does this actually correspond to? And certainly like, I, um, like, I don't know if these are actual variables in the macro or not. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that currently. Um, Presumably, this would be the sort of thing that like Microsoft would communicate and document uh, and supply to AV vendors so that they could make sense of like, okay, like what the, what the heck does this actually correspond to? Um, but we don't, we don't get that luxury. So um, this would probably require a little bit of reversing of what was that DLL? Um, vb7.dll that's probably going to be a freaking massive dll but by all means like anyone here who's who's interested like there, there's plenty of like research opportunities right here if you want to try to further contextualize this but i mean what's cool is at least like we're starting to get some interesting context here so like here's an indicator like right off the bat and we didn't introduce any external tooling to do our analysis, which I think is pretty cool. So we can just uh, you know keep keep digging in here, and um, you know same same deal. Like I, I wish I could make more sense of this, but I can't. Um, but here's our indicator again, <laughs> and uh, what is this? That I would imagine this is like a um, would this be like a sandbox escape technique? Does this like sleep for a period of time or something? Is that one minute? I don't know. Maybe someone here would know. Um, yeah. So like, I wonder, I, I wonder if, if this is still around. Well, I mean, presumably not if it's deleting that, but, but we could see. But I love that like we got indicators like right away. So yeah, it looks like it was deleted, unfortunately. But who knows? There might be there might be some additional indicators. Hey, look at what we got here. Uh, so do we want to take bets on what the contents of temp.bat is? I'm gonna put my money on this being the contents of temp.bat. All right. So we just got a little. You know your canonical uh, PowerShell downloader. Um, okay, so ASCII get string from base64. Cool. Let's just extract that. Clean it up a little bit. I'm missing a right paren. Oops. Cool. 
cool. But hey, I mean, you know, even without all this detailed context of what's going on, I think we got the gist. I mean, we got the meat of what's going on here, right? So super simple analysis at this point, right? Like this is this PNG is a file, right? So it's downloaded and it's executed as a command. So um, yeah, just additional PowerShell content. So dead man jogging, wondering if it's a uh, Z load payload or Z load or payload. Um, I'm not sure. Like I'm not connected to the internet to know. Um, yeah, maybe, <laughs> but um, I don't know. Without introducing any external tools and just doing this uh, ETW trace, I think this is like a solid win. So, oh, it's a uh, QBot. Okay, cool. All right, so, all right, yeah, so it looks like we've like formally made the transition into PowerShell away from VBA. So let me just do a quick sanity check that that was indeed the case. Um, let me just do admin. Oh. Okay, so there's a little bit like kind of interspersed in here. Um, I know PowerShell is not gonna get far if all it's doing is running the stager, right? Because it can't connect out and pull the the subsequent payload question will the video recording be available absolutely yes it's recording now i'm gonna uh it'll be on twitch for like a week or so i think um uh, but i also upload them to youtube and i'll put the link on uh on my twitter account as well cool and thanks for joining um so i just want to make sure that i'm not missing anything so I think what I'll do is I'll just group by the app name property. Yeah, and just look at the um, the Office VBA content. Group, and what was that? It's just called content, yeah. Group, uh, let's do, here, I'm just gonna dump all the content and only show the unique ones, all right? So this looks the same as that, same C2, that's the same, yeah. Oh, we got a sleep in, oh, cool. So, I mean, that's kind of interesting context. It looks like if there are any, um, I, I forget what you call it. Like if you're doing like Win32 API, like kind of P invoke type stuff in VBA, um, perhaps you get all of, all of those API calls in there. Thanks, S. Westy. Thanks for joining. Take care. Um, yeah, all these look the same. But again, I think this is super cool because, um, again, like I, I'm not super uh, up on like what the latest and greatest like macro stuff is, but um, like Casey Smith recently like brought to my attention the fact that there's a P loader written in pure VBA. So if you could get that context of like all the APIs that are being called, like how awesome would that be? Um, oh yeah, so you're saying that AMC, enable AMC logging.ps1 does not work anymore. Um, yeah, so at one point I posted that like, you can start an ETW auto logger, which is like an, uh, it's a persistent logger, where if you did that, then all PowerShell, no, what was it? It was, it was certain AMC content would be logged to the, um, like the, there's an actual AMC event log, but like that seems to no longer be the case. And there was some OS change that affected that. Um, so 
I never really dug into the re like what the actual OS change was that affected that script. Um, but unfortunately, like I don't think um, setting that auto logger will work <clears throat> for the purposes of capturing this AMC trace data directly to the event log. So sorry about that, but it's it's not my fault. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sad, sad panda. Um, okay, cool. So anyway, we get lots of indicators. Um, and honestly, like I'm pretty happy with all this, even though I don't have like the full context of what's going on. Okay. So it appears as though it did a decent job of, uh, cleaning itself up, but, um, oh yeah. So I, I think we're going to like start wrapping up here, but um, certainly fire away any, any questions that you have. The last thing I wanted to show you was uh, WMI tracing. So let's start our final trace. Cool. Wimic uh, process. All right, let's see if we got anything. Um, am I running this in a VM? Yes. What precautions do I take? Well, I'm not connected to the internet. <laughs> All right, um, okay, so I stopped that trace, ls, um, amc trace test, this was four, all right, cool. Looks like we captured some stuff, um, and get amc trace event. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, the, it it is a fair concern. You know, some malware does escape the VM. Um, you know, that's a that's a risk I'm taking uh, of running a uh, my macro that is running PowerShell on a disconnected VM um, that happens to be a, a VMware Fusion VM where my host is is macOS. So. Um, not not super concerned but it's a it's a good question and uh certainly um these are questions that um that that should be asked so thanks for asking um so this is cool note the uh unique app name wmi and the context that we get how cool is that all right so this was a recent addition i forget which windows build like maybe 1903, this was introduced, um, but don't don't quote me on that. Um, so we get what do we get? We get um, so process class. Um, so there's an instance of the process class um, where the command line property is set to Notepad, and that's I guess what. Um, Wait, where does it say create in here? Does it log create? Hmm. So that's kind of interesting. Oh yeah, we got the expected PowerShell being logged, but the only WMI one that was logged was not the create method being called, but a Win32 process class instance having its command line property set to notepad.exe. So hmm. I'll have to process that one a little bit, like why the create method was not called. 
but honestly, ultimately it would require um, reversing fastprox.dll, which I just don't feel like doing. But um, at least we have positive confirmation that um, some of these events are logged. So we get some context and uh, we have some insight into what AV vendors who opt into AMC uh, introspection are able to see. So whether you're an attacker seeking to evade this sort of thing, um, you now have a, a better idea of what your, the AV vendors you're going up against are able to see you do uh, to a limited extent. Um, and as a defender, um, I don't know, perhaps you have a little bit more confidence in the, um, in your vendor's abilities, assuming they have uh, AMC introspection, which uh, I believe it's Lee Holmes and Sean Metcalf um, have a spreadsheet somewhere. Um, I, th I think Lee Holmes took the lead on uh, maintaining that spreadsheet um, as to all of the third party vendors that do opt into AMC. So hopefully you've got a little more um, uh, insight and confidence in, in your vendor's ability to uh, introspect on these in-memory payloads. And again, specifically only these ones. Um, what I didn't cover was this. Um, you know what? We got time. Let's do it. Um, so, okay, Brian, uh, didn't you say on Twitter there's some limit to what AMC does with WIMI locally versus remotely, or am I mistaken? I think you're thinking of the, um, the DerbyCon presentation I did on where I was covering the WMI-activity ETW event provider. Um, yes, I'm pretty confident it was that. So yeah, you're, you're well, I, I'm not gonna make like any direct comparisons between like the context you get in AMPSI versus the WIMI activity um, log, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that as, as an exercise for, for the viewers. Um, question, how would you go about reversing a DLL? Um, feel free to check out the recording when it's posted. Um, we did a little bit of analysis in IDA. I didn't want to go too deep into that and that wasn't the, the purpose. So there's definitely better resources out there for, uh, for doing this, uh, for, for learning how to reverse um, DLLs and executables. Um, okay, so last thing I want to do is let's capture um, in memory uh, .NET assembly loads. Uh, okay, Eric, uh, thoughts on persisting using these traces with something like Silk ETW? Yeah, absolutely. So Ruben, um, or if you're still here, um, yeah, feel free to, to link to Silk ETW, which is like incredible. Um, what it allows you to do, you can specify, hey man. <laughs> um, so uh, obviously Ruben will be able to speak to it better, but you could configure Silk ETW to, um, to capture all of the AMC events in a persistent fashion to the event log. So really freaking cool stuff. And um, if you're not familiar with Ruben's work, then check him out because he is, uh, he's incredible. Uh, but he would never say that because he's far too humble. Okay, so let's capture the, the last thing here. Okay. Um, um, where should we start? Where should we start? Let's do, I have an idea. I didn't really think this through ahead of time. That's okay. So I want to capture .NET loads. So I started to trace, what if I, um, well, Let's do this. I'm just gonna supply some like really stupid C sharp code here. Um, we'll call this public class foo. How do you like that? Um, and then output assembly foo.dll. Okay. And now we will quote unquote load this in memory. So I'm just gonna pull the raw bytes of um, 
this binary. So I'll do IO file read all bytes uh, foo.dll. Oh, that needs to be a double quoted string. Okay. So we got that byte array, and now we will do our little in memory loader here. Load bytes. Okay, we have successfully loaded foo.dll, quote unquote, in memory. So let's see if we we're able to capture that context. Stop our trace. So we got something, but I'm sure it captured some PowerShell events. So I'm, I'm really hoping for the, the CLR events being in there. Ooh, this, this looks good. Yeah, there we go. Okay, let me, um, let me say this a variable and then pull this out. What was that? The how many events do we have? Just nine. Let's group by app name. Okay, so we just got that one and I think it was like the second to last one in that array. Yeah. Okay, so um, I guess I could have written some better code. Um, because yeah, in my function here, I assumed that the content would consist of um, a Unicode string in the case of CLR um, and like .NET, um, like in memory assembly or module loads, that's not the case. So let's just take the, um, let's do this again, but instead just to get win event on that. AMC trace five. Remember we have to do oldest. It should be probably should be this second to last event again. Properties dot net. Yep. Okay. So then that second to last property is no third. All right, quiz time. 77.90 in decimal is what? In ASCII. Someone better know. Okay, now I'm gonna write those bytes to a file. Actually, nah, I'm just gonna um, pass them to PowerShell's built-in um, hex display utility. Seventy-seven ninety forty-five A MZ. <laughs> You're too light, gray tones. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is really freaking cool that you can capture this with um, in straight up AMC. So I'm curious, um, what is the size of this array? So 3072, does that match the size of foo.dll on disk? It sure does. Um, last time I checked, um, I don't know that it imposes a limitation on the buffer size. Like, I think it just by default captures the entire contents of the PE. Um, but I would be surprised if like there wasn't a limit imposed on that. Cause like ETW 
uh, itself does have like buffer size limit uh, limitations. So, um, but anyway, like food.dll being a, a small PE, we still got the, <laughs> we recovered the full PE that was loaded entirely in memory. Well, quote unquote, entirely in memory. Like that, that wasn't the case in my, um, uh, in my silly little example here, right? But just imagine like downloading the contents of a .NET assembly um, compressed and then encrypted over the wire and then uh, decrypt, decompress, and then call the load method so that the PE contents like aren't actually touching the disk like, like they were in this case. Um, so yeah, let's see. So what do we cover? Um, we didn't cover UAC. Um, I mean, I guess if like people are still around, like maybe we could just experiment with that. See if we get any UAC context. Why the hell not? All right. Um, oh, and I get a UAC prompt when I launch, when I do this. So I'm curious if that logged anything. Okay. Nah, it doesn't look like it. Um. It could, I don't know. You know, I think the last time I looked into like UAC, AMSI stuff, it could be related to um, smart screen. So whenever you get a smart screen prompt, that could be, uh, I think, a potential way to capture that context with AMSI. I, I'm not sure. It's been a while since I, I, I've looked at it, to be honest. Um, but yeah, so. You'll have to experiment with that on your own. Um, but just the last time I looked at it, I, I just don't recall seeing anything like particularly rich in what was captured. Um, so we looked at a silly little sample J script payload. Um, I'd encourage you to test out like a .NET to J script sample doing the same C tracing and see what you get. Uh, we didn't look at any VB scripts this time, but expect the same output or like similar output in context that you get in JScript. Uh, we looked at some of the WMI tracing. We saw all the, all the PowerShell tracing occurring, which again, I mentioned was like redundant to um, script lock logging. Uh, and we saw that we could recover um, it appears the full PE contents of in-memory loaded .NET assemblies or modules, um, as well as capture some like pretty sweet IOCs from uh, VBA macros, even though the, we didn't quite get the, the full context based on like how um, those method names were logged using those numerical values. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. Um, whether or not like you can operationalize these techniques um, at scale is up to you. If you want to give that a try, um, I encourage you to um, uh, to give Silky TW a shot, um, so that you could take arbitrary ETW events and then log them to the event log. Um, otherwise, like. This is actually like a part of my uh, malware analysis workflow at this point. So if I'm dealing with like super heavily obfuscated VB script, J script, um, VBA macros, um, this is like the first step that I'll do to, to get some insight. And um, I don't know, like I'm not, <laughs> I'm not aware of any in the wild malware that checks to see if there's an active ETW trace occurring um, and then have like anti-analysis checks accordingly. But like through this analysis, literally all we did 
to capture the trace was called logman.exe to capture that ETL, which we then analyzed thereafter. So, uh, YouTube, uh, question is my YouTube the same as my Twitch name? Uh, yes, should be manifestation. Yep. Um, let's see, so a question from an offensive aspect, can we determine what part of a malicious payload or string MC trace is detecting malicious? The answer is no. That is going to be up to the AV provider and like in the context that we've captured via the like ETW tracing, you're not, you're not supplied with the context of like what actually flagged, right? So like um, in that case, you would see an AMSI event that would have, um, it would say AMSI result detected and it would give you the content, but no, it would not tell you what actually detected. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Uh, unless there are any last minute questions, I think I'm gonna wrap things up here. Um, I hope you all found this useful. Um, I found this to be like pretty fun stuff. Not always useful for everyone, but um, I always just enjoy the, the process that goes into like researching and like trying to make sense of, of this data. So um, if you did, glad you all enjoyed it. Uh, thanks a lot for joining. As always, I uh, just wanna thank you all for joining. Like I know my time is valuable. Like I'm doing this uh, in my personal time, but I know your time is valuable too. And I want to give my wife a shout out. Her time is extremely valuable while I'm doing all this. She's been watching the kids all day and she lets me do this every Tuesday. So uh, biggest of shout outs to my wife. She's awesome. Um, I love her. So, and I love you all. So uh, I will see you all next week and we will continue the conversation most likely about um, PowerShell constraint language mode. All right. Thanks everyone. Take care.